Hello, I'm Robert Ellsberg. I'm the publisher of Orbis Books. Very glad to be joined today by our author, James Finley, uh, the author of this wonderful book, The Healing Path, a memoir and an invitation. Uh, James Finley is a clinical psychologist and spiritual director. He is one of the core faculty at the Center for Action and Contemplation. He is a former novice under Thomas Merton at the Abbey, Abbey of Gethsemane, and he has written a classic book uh, about Merton, Merton's Palace of Nowhere. He is widely known for his retreats, workshops on the, on the mystics and the integration between psychology and spirituality. Uh, we've been friends now for some years, uh, and I feel so privileged to have had an opportunity to work with you on this book and to and to uh, publish it already uh, as we speak. It is going into a fourth printing, uh, you know, in the first uh, two months. So uh, it has already found a, a, a wide audience, and I know it's going to grow. Uh, to get a kind of flavor for what the book sounds like, because uh, I, I can't uh, describe it or give it justice, uh, I wonder if you could read a little bit from the introduction of the book, and that could kind of guide us uh, into talking about what you're doing in this book. Yes, yes, Robert, I'll do that. I'm so pleased we can do this uh, get, uh, around this work. <clears throat> uh, the opening words of the introduction to give a kind of a tone for the subject matter and the, the language for this. Uh, these reflections mark out a path, a way of life in which we as human beings may be healed from all that hinders us from experiencing the steady, strong currents of divinity that flow on and on in the bittersweet alchemy of our lives. So right at the beginning, uh, I'm setting kind of a poetic tone in which, by the bittersweet alchemy, I just don't mean the way our life goes in patterns, a moving from times of joy to times of sorrow and fear and then back to joy again and fulfillment. That it, I don't mean just that. By alchemy, I mean the alchemist of old, um, like turning lead into gold by drawing from the arcanum, like from ancient wisdom. And so the alchemy is discovering the steady, strong currents of divinity that are ribbon through the ups and downs of our life. So that by grounding ourselves in that felt sense of God's oneness with us in all things, um, we might come to this, um, the peace of God that surpasses understanding to sustain us and transform us in our life. I continue in the introduction. Uh, as I write this introduction, I'm immersed in these immense depths, sitting next to my beloved wife, Maureen, as she lies here dying in the final stages of Alzheimer's. Even though she is unconscious and cannot open her eyes to look at me, I believe she can hear me as I speak to her from my heart in whispered words. Just now I told her that the ways of unbearable pain and crying that from time to time overtake me seem to soften at least a little as I learn to be more accepting of the immensity and mystery of her death. For after all, immensity and mystery have been woven into our years together from the very start. When I say that I, I, I just now told her, reminded her of something I would, spoke to her about many times over the years, that when I was a novice in the monastery, uh, one of these old, an old lay brother had died, and Thomas Merton was speaking to the novices. And uh, he said, it's always helpful to remember that when we die, we don't go anywhere. We don't orbit the earth a few times and take off to go to God in some far off realm. Then in God, we live and move and have our being. We're living our life in the vast interiority of God. And so all the dead are here, all the angels and saints are here. And, uh, but we tend not to see that, that we're exiled from the all-encompassing divinity of every breath and heartbeat. And so the spiritual life is how to be healed from all that hinders us from finding our way to that awareness that alone is ultimately real and learning to live by it day by day. And, um, uh, and so I set this tone then 
the right in the beginning of this really immensely sad moment as Maureen was dying, there was a ribbon through it, this sense of God's oneness with me in and one with us in that sorrow. And uh, uh, and also I, I say too that uh, even though I knew in my heart this is true, like her deathless presence and God and fulfillment, because of the depths of sorrow, I couldn't feel it. But sometimes when we're overtaken by sad things, it eclipses the capacity, not just to be, find ourselves in our own life, but to find God's presence with us in our darkest hour. Mm -hmm. But as the months went by, it softened. And I began to uh, be, uh, sense her deathless presence, one with me here in this house where she and I lived for 30 years. And I find a kind of a, although there's sadness, uh, there's also a sense of comfort and mystery uh, in the unfolding of my days until my own death. And so what I do then is, in starting the book in this way, I then go back to the first chapter, the one I was three years old, this path in which I share a moment of trauma, I share a way I experience God's presence with me in the trauma. Where does the presence of God and suffering touch each other? And I draw out from it lessons that I learned, not just within myself, but years later in going through the monastery, leaving the monastery, and being a psychotherapist for almost 30 years. I sat with so many men and women who shared their healing journey with me. And so the book is I know, tended to be kind of a spiritual reading that invites us to find our way to this dimension of our life. It's, it's within all of us, but it's not easy to talk about. How do we meditatively find our way to that and to stabilize in it day by day and then share that with others? And so that's the sense of the book to my mind. Yeah. Well, you, you, you share a story that is marked by uh, kind of epic trauma, uh, maybe more extreme than, than most people uh, experience. Uh, but I think that uh, everybody can identify with the feeling that just the bad things that happen to you are not just things that happen to you, but they, they changed you. They, they formed your, your, you know, d distorted your own sense of, of, of self and personhood. Uh, and the, the, the book is this kind of dance or dialectic between these experiences of, of insight or healing and, and residual effects of, of trauma. But I, I was really interested in that kind of idea that, that what you're talking about maybe is in terms of healing is in some ways getting in touch with this capacity to see life or see reality in a kind of ultimate dimension uh, yeah. and you building on intimations that you had of that kind of awareness or wonder as a child uh, and that would come back to you at, at different times you know, even as you're experiencing uh, the, the the death of, of your wife in the beginning of the book yeah that's true um i guess uh, one of the ways to look at this is that um, in the moments when traumatizing events are actually happening, uh, they're truly terrible. I mean, to romanticize it or try to speak of it is really disrespectful to the pain of it, where you kind of drown and lose yourself in the pain. But also that if you stay with it, and sometimes with the help of another person, someone who sees us and cares or can help us, we see that although the painful event is painful, it's not just painful. That the, that the, that as we drop down into ever deeper layers of ourself, we, we experience the ways in which the interior depths of ourself drop down into and open out into the bottomless abyss of God, who's welling up and sustaining us unexplainably uh, through every breath and heartbeat. And by finding that groundedness in God, and learning how to stabilize ourselves in it, in the interior life, the interior path. Um, I think that's what the book's about, really, that kind of deep healing. Um, Jesus says, my peace I give to you, not as the world gives do I give to you. And the peace that the world gives is a peace that we experience in conditions conducive to peace. 
So if I'm physically healthy and my loved ones are healthy and I'm secure and stable, I'm at peace. But in pain and loss and struggles and just maybe horrendous things, I'm not at peace. So what is the peace of God that surpasses understanding? That is, what is it at peace that is ribbon through the sorrowful things of our life? And it unexplainably sustains us in it, which is what I mean when I say that God is a presence that protects us from nothing, even as God unexplainably sustains us in all things, which in Christian terms is the mystery of the cross. So how do I, how do I, what is the path along which I, I find my way to this and learn to live by it? There were, um, you know, you didn't just do this on your own. There were people who uh, seemed to appear in your life at moments when you needed them, uh, even as a child, when you discovered uh, the writings of Thomas Merton that that led you to kind of run away from home. And, and some yeah. people go to the circus. You went to the monastery, uh, and uh, lessons that that uh, Merton shared with you that stayed with you th through your life, even though he, other ongoing trauma forced you to leave. And then later on in life, uh, discovering. Maureen, and not only her love, but her uh, insistence or encouragement that you uh, seek uh, therapy to deal with your own kind of unresolved, uh, you no know, issues. Uh, uh, there were these, there were these angels who <laughs> kind of appeared in, uh, when you needed them, maybe, uh, and helped you along the way. It's true. It's really true. I. I... Uh, so, you know, I, I think for all of us, we can look back, or sometimes we, uh, sometimes we realize we're in the presence of someone who is more present to us than we were, mm -hmm. and they could see in us a value we weren't yet able to see, and how we learned to believe in their belief in us, and little by little it arced over into us, and uh, how we can stabilize and deepen that as an experiential salvation how we can come to God's presence in the day by day. Merton says it beats in our very blood whether we want it to or not. And also I, I say to people with this is, like how has it come to pass that you have come to be the man or woman who's even capable of being concerned about things like this, these subtle matters of the awakening heart? Mm -hmm. And is it not so that maybe five years ago or ten years ago or something, it wasn't like this? So if you look back at your own life, you couldn't have planned it if you tried. Mm -hmm. And it's a kind of a winding path that brings us to a point where we're able to intuitively resonate or intuitively uh, be touched by and be drawn to strength in this mysterious sense of God's sustaining presence, um, you know, in, in our lives. In, in, in one point, you kind of invite the reader to look back over their lives and and look backward at that kind of path that has led them to this moment to be the person who is reading this book. Now, maybe they're, you know, otherwise they're, if, if they're not <laughs> meant to read this book, they won't, or it won't mean anything to them. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but for those who, who uh, for whom it, 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 it has an important healing kind of message or invitation, as you say, uh there is a, a whole a background that has led to this to this to this moment yes one of the things i say or one of the things i look at in the book is that we get this feeling um in the in the demands and complexities of the day that we're being swept along um by the never-ending uh necessity of the next important thing we have to take care of like it's hard work being a human being and you get this feeling that you're skimming over the surface, <clears throat> <you're clears throat> that you're skimming over the surface of the depths of your own life. Mm. And what's regrettable about it is that God's unexplainable oneness with us is hidden in the depths over which we're skimming. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so there are certain moments in our life, we get a momentary taste of this oneness uh, in the midst of nature. Thomas Merton talks about being out in nature. We turn to see a flock of birds descending. Mm. Or he said moments we know love in our own heart, moments of intimate communion in the arms of the beloved. We're reading a child a good night story. Mm. or a quiet hour at day's end. There are certain moments, like hallowed moments, we get a touch of this oneness that we intuit is somehow always there. 
And so how, what is the path or the way of life in which I can learn to abide in the depths so fleetingly glimpsed? to heal that depth dimension and then draw up from that depth the encouragement or the power to touch the hurting places of the suffering that's found its way into our mind and heart mm -hmm. internalized past traumas and abandonments and pains and so from that depth dimension not to leave the pain of daily life in mystical realms but going into mystical realms to radicalize our presence to the hurting places, mm -hmm. which I think is how Jesus lived on this earth. And uh, so how can we follow that? So I think also when we look at life like this, like the details are never the same. Mm -hmm. The details is, there are the details of how we experience this is for each of us as unique as our signature or our fingerprints. Mm. But the underlying plot lines or themes of this are always the same. Mm. They were woven together in the common mysteries and complexities of the human experience. And so what is the mysterious place where the presence of God and suffering touch each other? Mm. And, and and how is it risky in that the intensity of the pain can eclipse the sense of God? But also, if we sit with it and stabilize it, and the presence of God kind of shines through, transforms and sustains us in what we're going through. And I, I think, too, that sometimes when we find ourselves in a very dark place and we find our way out of the darkness into the light, into better places, we're so grateful that we find our way back more to more light in our life. And we also know how important it is not to forget what we learned in the darkness mm -hmm. about frailty and the sustaining mystery of God's oneness with us in life and in death. And mm -hmm. so the book kind of attempts to poetically explore these patterns in our mm -hmm. life. I think, you know, you know the spiritual path and in, involves these these moments of insight or breakthrough i, I think of the disciples on the the, the transfiguration when they see jesus yeah. revealed yeah. in this kind of ultimate dimension you know they want to stay there uh but then you know build let's build three houses <laughs> yeah, yeah. but then it's time to go back down the mountain and already they're they're involved in squabbling about who's the greatest and all this mm -hmm. kind of stuff and you know how do we how do we hold on to the memory of of those moments in our lives or remember them or honor them in some way uh, so that we can find our way back to them when we're kind of lost in the dark? Yes. So here's the thing, too, I think. These moments, these grace moments that happen to all of us, sometimes are very powerful. Sometimes uh, there's a moment of oneness in the aftermath of which we're never quite the same. But almost always they're extremely delicate, like very mm -hmm. subtle. Mm -hmm. And we can't make them happen. But the thing is, we can freely choose to assume the stance that offers the least resistance to being overtaken by the oneness we can't attain. Mm -hmm. So lovers cannot make their moments of oceanic oneness happen. Mm -hmm. But together they can learn the ritual of the stance together that uh, offers the least resistance to tasting the oneness one more time. The poet can't make the poem come out onto, into the... Thing, but the poet can assume the interior stance that offers the least resistance to poetry emerging. And those committed to healing can't make healing happen, but they can assume the stance that offers the least resistance to the deep healing they're searching for that it can occur. And so I think that's how we do it. If we're faithful to our practice, like a daily rendezvous, hmm. where we can learn the habit of... of You can edit that out, right? <laughs> A bell of awakening. Go ahead. Uh, by the way, make it part of our talk. It's my my daughters call me every day to check up on me to see if I'm okay. And so are you? Are you okay? <laughs> I'm okay. So it's a sweet way to be interrupted. Kind That's of. Great. This, it's kind of what the book's about in a way. Absolutely. So I want to. So, so, so there's that. So we have this daily quiet time. And I, I talk about that, about meditative states and prayer and so on. And then at the end of each quiet time, ask God for the grace not to break the thread of that sensitivity as we go through the day. And I'd like to share one example of how I experience that it happens in therapy, mm, too. Yeah, good. Because uh, sometimes I think in moments of joy, there's these awakenings that we bring to the hurting places. Mm. 
But sometimes the joy unexpectedly breaks out in the midst of the hurting places. And uh, I give a number of those in the book. I like to share one as an example. Mm -hmm. I was seeing this woman in therapy some years ago, and she wasn't physically or emotionally abused as a little girl. But what happened is her parents would have these raging, intense fights with each other. And uh, they were so angry at each other, they couldn't, they couldn't see how their rage was scaring her. Like she felt invisible in their presence. And we were in therapy and she said one night, her parent, mother and father were screaming at each other. And she opened the back patio screen door, went out into the yard at night. And she climbed up into the low branches of a tree. And she closed one eye and lined up a twig with a star. Mm -hmm. And she said to God, if you know I'm here, make the star move to the other side of the twig. And she waited and she said to me, God didn't move the star. And then she said, but there's something about the remembrance of myself sitting as a little girl alone in the dark, waiting for God to move a star that, can, that moves me. And I said to her, yes, it's true. God didn't move the star. But years later in sharing that story with me, you were moved. Mm. And because you shared it with me, it moved me. I said, so in our work together, if ever we get to a place where we're stuck, how to move on, let's imagine we're sitting together in the low branches of the tree waiting for the star to move. Mm -hmm. And I think I, I, in therapy, I saw a lot of moments like that where just a subtle shift mm -hmm. of a kind of a finding one's footing, you know, in an interior place from which to face and walk through what you need to face and walk through. I think sometimes that's how the deep transformation happens out of moments like that. You think that, that you know, for all of us with our wounds and especially people who have experienced, you know, deep uh, trauma, we tend to kind of have a narrative about our lives uh, that we repeat constantly. Uh, and that becomes who we are. We are that story. Uh, and so how do you help people then, I guess, through, you know, holding up a kind of mirror or offering a different way of looking at something, offer a kind of off-ramp from that repetitive kind of story that we tell ourselves. Right. One of the ways I put it in thinking of this as psychotherapy healing is that when we risk sharing what hurts the most in the presence of someone who will not invade us or abandon us, we can learn not to invade or abandon ourselves. We can kind of be reparented in being in the presence of someone who simply treats us the way we deserve to have been treated from the day we were born. Mm -hmm. and we can move that. Deeper down, it's true, though, too, that when we risk sharing what hurts the most in the presence of someone who will not invade us or abandon us, we can come upon within ourselves what Jesus called the pearl of great price. Mm -hmm. It's the invincible preciousness of ourself in the midst mm -hmm. of our frailties. Mm -hmm. And uh, another thing I think is significant in this regard is in the Gospels, when we look at the healing stories in the Gospels, mm -hmm. in a way the pattern's always the same. Mm -hmm. That Jesus would come out of whole nights alone in prayer, kind of walking the earth to free people from suffering. Mm -hmm. And when the word got out, the people came looking for him. My yeah. daughter died, I have leprosy, a pro mm -hmm. prostitute, whatever. And it's, and so Jesus does a, a, a relieves them from like the blind can see and the dead, the lame can walk. It's stunning, mm -hmm. but then he says that the true miracle is interior. Yeah, right. And how I put it, uh, experiential salvation, is poetically when he was standing with the suffering person in the healing moment, he realized that the real problem wasn't that they couldn't walk or see or but mm. they thought they were what was wrong with them. Yeah, right. And and poetically, he says this to them, I think. This is the Trinitarian interdivine life of God. Jesus says to the person, it's a secret between the two of them. Yeah, Jesus right. says, I know you from all of eternity. God the Father eternally contemplated you and me, hidden with Christ and God forever before the origins of the universe. Mm -hmm. This is the you that was never, never born, because God has never, never, never not known who you are in me forever. And that you that was never born will never die because God will never, never forget who you are in me forever. Mm -hmm. And in that moment, reflected in his eyes, they saw their true face like mm -hmm. this.
Mm -hmm. and, and they found that depth dimension that grounded them to move on and live their life. And I think that's a nice poetic image of that, uh, that depth dimension of healing that I'm, that I'm exploring or inviting the readers to explore in their own life in this book. Mm -hmm. There's so many of those encounters uh, in the gospel that don't usually, you know, are not counted as healing uh, stories, but, you know, where his encounter with the Samaritan uh, woman, yeah. and she, she goes off and says, you know, come and see a man who told me everything I ever did, you know, like he knows me, yeah. he saw me, you know, yeah. or when Peter says to Jesus, uh, leave me, Lord, I'm a sinful man, you know, and, yeah. and, uh, and there's some way in which Jesus kind of seeing the person, seeing, that you, as you say, that kind of pearl of their true self within them that is with God uh, has a, this transforming uh, effect and they leave, you know, they leave healed in some deep it's, fundamental way. It's really true. Because that's at the heart of the gospel, really, is the deep acceptance of our brokenness is the portal mm -hmm. through which God's infinite mercy touches our heart. In the, in the work that I do on mystical sobriety, like the mystical dimensions of recovery, you know, they talk about making a fearless inventory of your mm -hmm. life. Mm -hmm. And I say, well, what's a fearful inventory? Because <laughs> you've already known enough of broken, sad things about yourself. You're afraid to know what else is back there. Mm -hmm. See? But what's a fearless inventory? See, It doesn't matter what else is back there. It's just one more broken dimension of yourself that God's infinitely in love with because God's in love with you in your brokenness. Mm -hmm. And I think to find that place, see, increasing conscious contact with God as we understand him, it's, it's a groundedness of a peace that isn't dependent on the outcome of my efforts, because it's sustaining me unexplainably in the unfolding of my days. Mm -hmm. like that. Yeah. I, um, I I love the, you know, the, the way the path, you know, imagery of, has different kind of meanings of the healing path, the spiritual path, and I, I thought of of a uh, of a text by or an interview that Pope Francis gave that that moved me very deeply, where he, he says ours is not a laboratory faith; it's a journey faith, yeah. uh, in which we meet God along the path. You know, yeah. uh, and that means that it's a, a journey that is not just a you know kind of intellectual insights, uh, but a capacity to be surprised by things you didn't know, to grow, to be converted, to have moments of doubt and failure. And, uh, That's true. As you say, it's, as you, and, and as you say, it's not a linear path, uh, but there's yeah. a circularity to it. Yes. Also, you know, the, the theologian Bernard Larnigan, he said, religion is a lot more like falling in love with someone than it is proving something. <laughs> yeah. you know, it, uh, it really is. Yeah, that's, the, that's the relational like intimate tenderness, you know, that's the essence we, with God's grace, we learn to live by it. You know. As your, your path uh, has continued since you wrote this, this book, uh, and it begins with uh, reflections, you know, as Maureen is dying, uh, and now that's a couple years uh, past, I, I wonder if you could say something about what your relationship with her feels like now in the present. Yes, uh, she died here in the living room in house hospice, and her ashes are out in the living room on the table. And every day I write six hours a day in the morning. I read this kind of a thing. I write or read the mystics, and I have my rocking chair right where she died. And I look out at the ocean right outside the window that she and I looked out many, many times, and. Uh, it's become, uh, I tell people that I, I feel old. I'll be 80 years old, end of May. I feel old, tired, fragile, lonely, sad, amazed, and grateful. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, we had a ritual with each other. We'd sit out on the porch and watch the sun go down every night over the ocean. And I'd have a glass of wine. She, for years, she was in recovery with sobriety and really changed her life, really. And uh, so I would sit and write, have a glass of wine or something, and with my fountain pen, I'd work on one of my books on prayer. And then the ritual was, she'd say, I'm gonna go in. And I, and she would go back into the bedroom, turn on the TV, we'd go back and I'd, we'd have dinner. And I'd say, I'll be in in 10 minutes. And I would get writing 
And 20 minutes later, I'd still be writing. And she would come out and point to her wristwatch and go, <coughs> you know, like uh, you said, 10 minutes, it's been 20 minutes. And, I would, and she always would interrupt me right at the edge of a deep thought. <laughs> and I can remember a lot of times I'd put the cap on my fountain pen and say, you know, the day may come that I would do anything to have you come out here and interrupt me. And that day has come. See, you know, you're gone. You're gone. And yet, although you are so painfully gone, you're not gone at all. Because in love, I think, the, the, the veil between life and death becomes more diaphanous. You know, it becomes more in, interpersonal. Like, you know what I mean? It's like a communion, like a oneness and a communion. And, and so I, I just find this time of my life to be so mysterious. And uh, I'm much, much closer to my daughters than ever. And because of the Turning to the Mystics podcast, I get to teach this way with right here in my living room. And uh, just one, one day at a time, I just, I just feel like blessed. <laughs> Yeah. And what about your relationship with Thomas Merton, uh, uh, who spoke to you when you were 14 years old, you know, about uh, solitude and, and uh, drew you uh, to him. And now you've spent so much of your, your life reflecting on what he taught you and what you've learned through his books and your own teaching and ministry. Yes, I think... Um... When I first discovered Thomas Merton when I was 14 in high school and uh, read his journal, The Sign of Jonas, like over and over again, all this trauma was going on at home. It was kind of a nightmare, really. So then when I was in the monastery and lived in this in the silence, this cloistered monastery, chanting the Psalms and so on, I really saw him as a lineage holder in the mystical heritage of the Christian tradition down through the ages, like Meister Eckhart, the Cloud of Unknowing, Teresa of Avila, um, these mystics back all, all the way back into Jesus spending whole nights in prayer. And that he he was a lineage, that I was in this presence of this living lineage. And he guided me in it, in my own transformations in prayer. And in the classical texts of the mystics, St. John of the Cross and so forth, it, just, it, was, just, it was just a stunning thing. And once he told me, we were talking about this, about oneness with God. And he said, once in a while, he said, you'll find someone with whom you can talk about such things. He said, but they're hard to find. He said, a lot of people don't even know about it. And those who know about it say you can put it off till later. And he said, but a lot of you'll spend a lot of your life without such a person. He said, that's your solitude. But you have God, you have the scriptures, you have your life, you have people. And so I, I find uh, like his deathless presence is with me too. I sense it, I sense it very much. And, uh, and I was blessed with Maureen because she was very much this way. She was very reclusive and kind of interior. Our whole marriage is <laughs> woven with this sense. So uh, anyway, it was like a mystical marriage. I was just very blessed that way. So, uh, yeah, he changed my life. He, they say in the Buddhist tradition to all of the, you know, you, there's no way, you, you, there's no way to express your gratitude for the teacher. Mm -hmm. No way to express it. Another, I, think, I like this in the Buddhist tradition. I think I see it in Merton too, that the awakened teacher senses your reverence for them, and so uh, they accept it as a temporary arrangement. Because you, you're not yet ready to realize that the depth you see in them is entirely true of you, too. Mm -hmm. But you can't bear to realize it. So, and because if they told you that, you wouldn't believe them. And because teachers don't argue, they accept the reverence. Mm -hmm. Until little by little by little, there can be this dawning in your heart uh, that God's infinitely in love with you and shining out and giving herself to you unexplainably in your brokenness. And then the teachers are delightfully unemployed, you know, because then you're, <laughs> you're, you're equals. You know I mean, you're infinitely, yeah, two infinitely love broken people mm -hmm. in a world of infinitely love broken people. And that's how the lineage is passed on, I think. And so I think it was through all these other mystics I, that I read and so on and so touched me. And, uh, 
But I don't know, being with Merton, be, being in the presence of an awakened person can change your life. You know, and uh, mm -hmm. Richard Rohr says, you know, in the ashram, when the when the realized yogi dies, they say the ashram is empty until the next realized yogi comes. Namaste. And mm -hmm. uh, and how how what's the contagious energy in which that's handed on till it, it, it wakes up in you mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the book. The Healing Path book is about that too, I think. Well, thank you. We're 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 uh, drawing uh, to, to the end here. I wanted to share with the uh, the listeners just a, a memory of our first meeting, which was at Louisville at the International Thomas Merton Society, and I was sitting in a kind of gazebo, and I was a little too shy to to come up and introduce myself to you. I I'd heard your your talk. I was amazed by it. Uh, and you kind of were kind of circling around and looking for a place to sit down. And then you sat down right next to me. And we fell into this conversation that was very much like this. Within just about five minutes, I, I felt that uh, that I had, we had begun a conversation uh, that, and a friendship that I wanted to continue forever, uh, never uh, suspecting that I would get a chance to work with you on, on such a yeah. beautiful and intimate and important book that touches me so deeply yeah. uh and so i want to thank you very much uh, for oh, yeah. writing this and for joining me today and, and i think we meet people on the path i so also cherish our friendship as, i mean what a gift and the fact that orvis books have published this book and it, it seems so providential mm -hmm. to me i'm so grateful for it so yeah i, I, I remember that conversation very well uh, well, well thank you very much james yeah. finley author of The Healing Path, a memoir and an invitation. Thank you very much. You're welcome.